Well, hi everyone and greetings from Northern Michigan. This is Bob the Science Guy. You know, in reviewing the comments for my videos for the last week or two, uh, some viewers have put up some questions that they had or corrections that they wanted me to make. I want to take today to go ahead and do a couple of those. So let's have a quick update on the relative density versus buoyancy experiment. We're also going to correct some errors I made in the flight planning tutorial just to clarify a few things. We're going to have a short video from Sean Hawkins on the shadow of Mount Rainier and some updated experiments that he did. And we're going to finish up with the two bonus questions from yesterday's video. We're going to go through them real quickly and identify the folks that answer the question correctly. So let's cue up the music and get going. You know, the first thing that I want to address is some concerns that were brought up in my buoyancy versus relative density experiment, specifically having to do with the balloon, the sinker, and my moving car. Now, many of us consider the vector of gravity to be going downward because we drop the pen, the pen goes down. That's not really the correct way to look at it, though. And I want to clarify that because it was brought to my attention by a number of posters that I should have done it the correct way rather than the common way. The pen itself is not moving. It's the earth coming up towards it. Using that framework with the positive direction of the vector of gravity going upward. So let's look at the setup in the car. Now, I've marked the vector of gravity going upward you can see that the balloon is going in the direction of the vector of gravity and the sinker is going opposite the direction of gravity. Now when you're dealing with a vehicle accelerating forward, it's easy to look at it in this side view. Notice that the acceleration of gravity is going from right to left and the acceleration of the vehicle is going from the rear to the front and I've marked those with arrows. Part of the experiment was to see what would happen to the balloon and the sinker when you apply this forward acceleration. And as we recall, what happened was the balloon went forward, the sinker went to the rear. Now when I decelerated from 30 miles an hour to zero, once again, the vector of gravity is now going from the left to the right, but the action of the deceleration, which is an acceleration to the rear, goes from the front of the car to the back of the car. And again, we watch to see what the balloon and the sinker did with that. The reason I'm making this correction is in the original video, the vectors were reversed. Now the next error that I want to point out is in the flight planning tutorial that I did a couple of days ago. Most of my flying is two to three hundred miles. Now I do fly great circle courses, but there's not much of a curve in them because they're relatively short hauls. When you're dealing with a flight from Los Angeles to Anchorage to JFK and back to Los Angeles like this, it's a much longer course and the curve of the great circle course is more pronounced. So as a result, you have an accurate departing heading. But if you just do it in one direction, you don't have an accurate arrival heading. So the way to do this properly is to run it clockwise and get the departure headings and then run it counterclockwise and get the departure headings to get the true angles at the corners. Now when you do that, you come up with true angles like this. Now as you can see, the total sum of those angles is 192 degrees, not 205. Be sure to use the track courses as well. Okay, the final update is this short video by my friend Sean Hawkins. Now, I had done a series of videos on the setting sun and Mount Rainier and the shadows that were cast by the mountain on the clouds above it. Now, those videos were really quite comprehensive, but one thing that some of the posters had talked about was the shape of the shadow. Now, I hadn't included that in my videos, because I didn't think that I needed to. However, Sean did do a short video showing that the shadow shape will tell you whether or not the mountain is above or below the clouds and whether the sun is coming from above or below the peak of the mountain. So let's go ahead and have a quick look at that. What we see, right? Let's say we're on right here. What we see, pea brain, is this. Oh, let me get it lined up. 
Am I correct or not? Do we not see that on the underside of the clouds? There's the light under, pointing up, and we see, notice that the shadow is teeny at the, where it starts at the cloud to the right and gets bigger, right? Because it's basically an upside down scene. If you turn it upside down, you will get a shadow like you'd expect, right? Now, let's say, let's see what it looks like from the top of the mountain. Oh, same thing, right? I'm still below it, right? Still below it. There we go. Now, let's see what happens if, it, if you're at the top of the mountain, if, you're, if the light is above the mountain. So let's bring it up there. Oh, wait a second. That's not at all what we see, is it? We don't see the, the shadow starting big and getting and getting smaller to a point, do we? Because that's what you'd see if the mountain was above the clouds and the light was below the cloud or above the clouds and above the mountain. Right? Now if it's below, you won't see anything on the clouds from the point of view of the top. When it gets to sunset. It's exactly what we see, isn't it? Can you see that? And the lower it goes, the bigger, the wider the shadow gets. Right? It's down there. That's what we see in the pictures. And there's no way you can fake it any other way. Just goes to show that, you know, for the last four videos, we have been showing evidence that the sun is below the peak of the mountain and the shadow is being cast upward onto the cloud deck, which is above the mountain. This is not perspective. This is curvature of the earth and how sunsets work. And you can clearly see that there is a gap between the top of the mountain and the clouds. And the narrow part of the shadow is at the peak of the mountain and then it widens out. Now, just to show it's not an optical illusion due to perspective or whatever they're trying to claim. Here's a side view. The shadow starts small and it gets bigger. The sun is below the peak of the mountain. The clouds are above the peak of the mountain and the shadow is being cast upward onto the cloud base. And we've just seen the demonstration of that in Sean's basement. So hopefully that settles it. Okay, now the moment you've all been waiting for, the answers to the bonus question. Bonus question number one, if the International Space Station orbits at an altitude of 400 kilometers and the radius of the Earth is 6378 kilometers, the drop to the horizon is 19.793 degrees. How far is the horizon? Well, the correct answer is 2,203.346 kilometers or 1369.8 373 miles. And Michael Caracos, hope I pronounced that correct, got the correct answer first. Now, we get honorable mentions to Diego Carapini, Sneaky Fox, Trevor Austin, and Richard Washburn, who also got the correct answer. But many of them use the Pythagorean theorem. And bonus question number two. In a commercial airliner, how high did J. Tolan Media 1 have to be in order to see Hudson Bay 1,200 miles away? Again, our winner is Michael Caracos. He got both of them right, and he got them right first. Sable Eagle used a different method and came pretty close. Diego Carafini also used a different method and came pretty close, as did Art B., and Trevor Austin. So well done, gentlemen. Now, one of the biggest problems that I ran into with this exercise is that tests are given for two reasons. One, it is to assess the knowledge of the students, but more importantly, it's to assess the effectiveness of the teacher. This lesson was on the method Al Biruni for calculating the radius of the earth. My goal was to get you comfortable with it and have some light bulbs turn on. The fact that a large number of people ignored this and used the Pythagorean theorem 
tells me that I wasn't very effective in getting that message across. I will try and do better in the future. Now, let's go through these problems and I'll show you how I was looking to see that they get done and the answers that I was looking for. Okay, so bonus question number one was designed to see how well you understood the basics of the Al Biruni formula. Now recall, this angle right here is alpha. And in the example, that was listed as 19.793 degrees. This is the angular drop to the horizon. Now the key to this problem is understanding that this angular drop here also equals this angle right here. So this is 19.793. So in order to figure out how far the horizon is, from the ISS, all you have to do is do 19.793 divided by 360 times the radius of the Earth, and if you work it out, it's just shy of 40,075 kilometers. So, the answer is 2,203 Point three four six kilometers to the horizon. Now you can do your own conversion to miles, but I think it's around 1,379 miles or so. But again, the purpose of this question was to see whether or not I effectively taught that this angle equaled that angle. So let's go on to bonus question number two. Now, just as I wanted to emphasize the fact that this angle equaled the drop angle in bonus question number one, in bonus question number two, I want to see whether or not you understand the formula. Now, here's the basic setup. We have J. Tolan Media One up in his airplane. We have Hudson Bay out here. It's 1,200 miles, and that represents 17.349 degrees on the, on the circumference of the Earth. That means his drop angle is also 17.349. But that's not important for this question because that's not what we're looking for. We're trying to solve for how high is J. Tolan Media 1. And for that you need to recall the Al Biruni formula. And that is height times cosine alpha over 1 minus cosine alpha equals r. That's what we're looking for right there. So let's rearrange it a little bit. Let's stick it over here. See how that works out? And when you plug the numbers into it, you get your altitude in miles because that's the unit that we're using. He's 186.55 miles above the surface of the Earth, which means that he gets his astronaut wings on a commercial airliner. Not a bad trick. Well guys, I hope you enjoyed this presentation. Um, just kind of caught up on a few things, answered our bonus questions, and maybe learned a thing or two. So, signing out from Northern Michigan, this is Bob the Science Guy. Before you go, hit that little like and subscribe button down there. I'm not getting a lot of new subs right now, and I don't really know why. So, if you aren't subbed to my channel, go ahead and hit the button now if you would. I'd really like to have you in the group. Alright? Take care, guys.